Welcome and thank you for joining Alumni Weekend as we celebrate our remarkable alumni and their contributions across so many professions exhibiting such broad talents. Due to the pandemic, Michael Sugar, class of 1995, was unable to receive his award last year. And so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to recognize and celebrate his accomplishments and to introduce a dialogue between him and one of our most esteemed faculty members. That esteemed faculty member is Professor Thomas Dougherty, a cultural historian and professor of American studies here at Brandeis. Tom's work reflects a special interest in Hollywood cinema, and he has written several books, including Teenagers and Teen Picks, The Juvenilization of American Movies in the 1950s, Cold War, Cool Medium, Television McCarthyism in American Culture, and Show Trial, Hollywood, HUAC, and The Birth of the Blacklist. His most recent book, Little Lindy is Kidnapped, How the Media Covered the Crime of the Century, was published last year. Michael was one of Tom's students here at Brandeis, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to listen to their conversation on a topic that I suspect sparks an interest in all of us, one way or another. And now it's my honor to recognize Michael Sugar as the winner of the 2020 Alumni Achievement Award. Michael Sugar, class of 1995, is an Academy Award-winning producer and the CEO and founder of Sugar 23, a management production and private equity company. At Brandeis, he was active in the student union and worked at BTV, Brandeis's television station. An American studies major and film studies minor, Michael took three film studies classes with Professor Tom Dougherty. In addition to sharing his deep knowledge of film and cultural history, Professor Dougherty gave Michael the simple yet formative advice, don't just make films, make good films. After graduating as the valedictorian of his class, Michael went on to law school at Georgetown. He then followed in the footsteps of his father, a film producer and distributor. In 2016, Michael was awarded the Oscar for Best Picture for Spotlight, a film about the Boston Globe's investigation into child molestation within the Catholic Church and the attempts to cover it up. He has produced a number of series and features, including The Laundromat, Dickinson, Maniac, I Am the Night, The Report, The OA, The Nick, and the hit Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why. He won Peabody Awards for the series, The Nick and Dickinson. In 2017, after a long stint at Anonymous Content, where he was the partner for many years, he founded Sugar 23, which is partnerships with Netflix and Time Magazine, among others. The company works across media and recently launched an independent podcast studio in-house, as well as a book imprint in partnership with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Recent movie credits include The Report, starring Adam Driver, Annette Benning and John Hamm about the Senate investigation into the use of torture and in interrogation by the CIA following 9-11, and Worth, starring Michael Keaton about Ken Feinberg, administrator of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Michael is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, the Producers Guild of America, and the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. He lectures regularly at USC, NYU, Columbia, and the American Film Institute. And so with great admiration, I now present Michael Sugar with the 2020 Alumni Achievement Award, whose citation reads, Michael Sugar, class of 95, a leading film and television producer whose projects reflect a passion for inquiry and exposing injustice. Winner of an Academy Award for Best Picture for Spotlight and two B-Body Awards for the series, The Nick and, and Dickinson, Founder of Sugar 23, an emerging management and production company supporting creativity across numerous platforms. In recognition of distinguished contribution to one's profession or chosen field of endeavor, the Alumni Achievement Award represents the highest form of university recognition bestowed exclusively upon alumni. The Brandeis Alumni Association is delighted to confer the 2020 Alumni Achievement Award to Academy Award winning film and television producer, Michael Sugar, class of 95. Congratulations. Thank you very much, appreciate that. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Michael and to Professor Thomas Dougherty. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Ron, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and to chat with Michael about uh, things education and things Hollywood. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry we can't do this uh, person to person, face to face, and hopefully next year or at some point when all this uh, digital reality is over, we can uh, uh, sit down and have a, uh, another kind of conversation. 
uh, but this is really a pleasure. And I thought what we could do uh, you know, for the next 30 or 40 minutes is to uh, talk about your career. I'd like to especially get your observations on uh, what's going on in the motion picture industry today and to maybe do a kind of Ralph Edwards, this is your life, which is a reference people under a certain age won't get, but people over a certain age uh, might get, uh, trajectory of your, your life and career. And maybe a good place to start is uh, uh, just tell me uh, you know, where you grew up, you know, uh, who your parents are, what they did. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, it's really an honor and, and thanks to President Leibowitz for this. And, and Tom, there's no better person for me to do this with. My experience of Brandeis is so connected with you and the time we shared and, and the lessons I learned from you. So I'm really grateful for you uh, doing this. Uh, I'm an LA native. I'm one of the few Southern California natives uh, that live in Southern California still. I grew up uh, I grew up in, um, in an industry family. My, my, my father was a pioneer in international distribution and subsequently became a producer. Uh, my mom was uh, similarly a producer and in acquisitions. And it was just something, telling stories was something I wanted to do since I was a kid. Uh, my brother and I, I, I think my brother's watching, uh, we used to pretend that we were studio executives when we were kids. And I don't know why uh, that was because both my parents really uh, pushed us into thinking about other things uh, because the entertainment industry is fraught with lots of unholy things that parents don't want their kids to experience. So in spite of their wisdom and advice, um, it's just something that I could never shake. Uh, and it was solidified in my experience really at Brandeis because I saw the power of storytelling uh, and, and the impact that I could create or I hope to create in, in the world through, through that medium or, or, or all of these media now that are, you know, have expanded a lot uh, beyond film. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was in, I was in LA. I went, I left high school a couple of years early to go attend an international school called the United World College, which was also really important for me. And, and then I went into Brandeis and, and that was sort of my stint on the East Coast uh, where it began. I went to DC for law school. And then really have been back and forth between LA and New York ever since. And uh, LA is home. I have an amazing wife, Lauren, and I have a four and a half, almost five-year-old son, Cooper, uh, which makes everything worthwhile and um, gives me the strength to do this. Great friends, many of whom uh, I still am very close to from Brandeis. I'm sure many of them are here. Um, Mike Mayer, who's been one of my closest friends since I'm 12 years old, is now my partner and, and runs our podcast business among other things. So this is a Brandeis family even at work and I'm just happy to be here. Uh, how did you choose Brandeis? Um, I was, how did I choose Brandeis? I, I, well, partly because Mike Mayer was there uh, and he was having mm -hmm. such a good experience, uh, but also because I had, I, I really liked the idea of being in a school that was prestigious and top notch, but also wasn't so steeped in tradition that had been 200 years formed that I could maybe, you know, be part of some disruption within it. That was my ambition at the time. I wanted to be in Boston and I just loved the, the energy when I came to campus. And, and so it was a, a number of factors, but I, but I loved it. And uh, when I went there the first time, so it was pretty much, uh, Fait accompli when I when I walked the campus for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I didn't know I've mentioned. I love hills. Myself. I love really really uncomfortable hills. That's my jam. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it keeps you in shape. Uh, yeah. I think I might have mentioned this to you, Mike. But one of the things I remember about your generation, and there are certain classes when you teach that are kind of just uh, uh, golden that you keep them in your mind for all time. And uh, Mike uh, was part of a generation of students that were just really unparalleled. And I remember, uh, especially uh, when we were involved in the film seminar, I mean, was it, I think it was your junior year. It's usually a senior year class. I, I can't remember uh, uh, quite specifically, uh, but I'd, I'd walk into those classes and basically just uh, sit down and turn you guys on. Uh, it was a group of about 10, 12, really, uh, terrific and memorable students. I, uh, uh, Andrew Douglas was in that class, I believe. Uh, and uh, Mike Mayer was part of that crowd as well. And one of the things that 
I like about Brandeis uh, so much, and it was really true of your question, was that the students were both rigorous, but they also had fun. And that that was sort of that you really loved the medium of cinema, but you did the work, you did the reading, you came into class loaded for bear. So for me, it was always a, you know, I, I tell students, and I think maybe not just to, uh, uh, to stroke them, that one of the great things about teaching film is that uh, you learn something from every class because the people around the table have an expertise you don't have, whether it's in music or fashion. So a different set of eyes can always teach you something, maybe in a way, if you're teaching chemistry or accountancy, uh, you might not get that same kind of information each time. And your group was like especially uh, memorable. Uh, your class was the one that Sumner Redstone came to visit, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, now uh, I remember a story about you and Sumner Redstone that you might wanna tell. Uh, because I think it's sort of an operative definition of chutzpah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of stories from Sumner, but I'm an opportunist. So when he came, I, I, I figured it was, that was my way to start selling shows. And so I wrote him a letter after our class about an idea that I had for a TV show. And I got a response. And a month later, I was in New York pitching the president of MTV. And we sold the show. It was the first show I ever sold. I wish I, I wish we made that show, but we never made it. Um, and then I ended up seeing Sumner. My first movie that I ever made was uh, a, based on the book, A Separate Piece that I produced with my brother, JB. And it was a Paramount movie. He had just acquired Paramount and, and he was incredibly gracious to us in that process. So he's, he sort of stayed around. I mean, he's a, he was a controversial figure for sure, but in my life, he was really, um, he was, he was helpful and, and kind. And it was interesting because he never, commu he only communicated by fax. Uh, there was no, even when emails were around, he would just send faxes. And, and he was a, a handwriter. He would, he would write his notes to me. And um, so, yeah, he's, he was, it was a great opportunity for me to meet him. And uh, it actually was quite a, a door opener in my career. Thanks, Brandeis. Yeah. Uh so uh, you graduate Brandeis. Now, was it at Brandeis that you really decided to get into the business? I knew I was always going to do it. It was something that I always wanted to do, but it was really, you know, when you're in college, you have the opportunity to be exposed to different things. And I, I always wanted to go to law school as well. So I was open-minded, yeah. I suppose, but I never shook it. You know, I never shook this desire to, to be a producer. And it was just something that I've wanted. I, I, I don't... I, you know, the closest I ever came other than wanting to be a professor, which sometimes when I have bad days, I think of just quit and, and, and do my true passion, which is, that's what I will do at some point. Um, the only other job I ever really considered for a minute was the JAG, like going into the JAG court, because I was in law school and I was getting recruited by the intel, you know, the agency to come be in the JAG court. And I was like, you know, thinking about a few good men and how good looking they all were. And I thought maybe I look good in uniform, but um, I was, I was, I was seduced by it for about a month. And then I realized, nah, I don't think I can do that. So it's really the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Can you tell us exactly what a producer does? Like, I, I don't know if you want to pick spotlight might be the thing that we're most familiar with most of the audience. Uh, but, uh, to, or, 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 you know, 13 reasons why picks a, a project. And maybe if you could lead us through from, you know, when you first become involved with it to fruition. Yeah, every, every, every project that I do is sort of bespoke in its um, expectations of the producer, but the general, the general way I would describe the role that I play, at least as a producer, is sort of like being a co-founder of a company where the, you know, the, the other founder is usually the writer or whoever creates the IP. And then my job is to take that from the moment it's conceived to the, the, the release of the product. And so in a sort of corporate analogy, I'm, I am the sort of co-CEO of that business. And, and my job is to make sure the product is developed properly, the screenplay, uh, and to make sure that when we go to production, we have the money. So I do my fund, the fundraising, 
And that can come from individuals or private equity or studios or, or, or streamers. And then I'm on set, uh, generally I'm on set to ensure the quality, the, the, the quality control and, and be there to assist in the creative process, but really empower the filmmaker. And then my job is to make sure there's a marketing campaign and the product is delivered. And then sometimes there's Oscar or awards campaigns and other times not, usually other times not for me, unfortunately, but you know, I'll take, I'll take one. But the, but the, the job is really to run the business of the movie. Um, and that includes creative uh, input, but it's, but it's largely a professional strategy. Spotlight was, was brought to me by two women, um, Blythouse and Nicole Rockland, who had uh, this idea and, and had done a ton of research and came into my office one day with boxes of, of stuff. And so, so we got involved eight years prior to shooting the movie with that and called all this information. And then we flew to Boston and interviewed the spotlight team and found a writer and a director. And, and, and so that was a really long process that sometimes they go real fast where something will come in. I've had an experience where we got a script on a Friday and we were shooting 12 weeks later. That's rare. Um, and, and most of the time it's, it's a longer build. So we have uh, the movie that we have worth coming out in the fall. It was also similar to Spotlight, almost a 10 year pro uh, process from the beginning. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's a nebulous job in some ways, but I think the closest way to describe my role is to sort of, I run the business of the creative process. And, and unlike a director, you, you maybe have several irons in the fire at the same time. Correct. Correct. I mean, how do you manage that? You know, like anybody, you just you you have to pick your moments and and try to be in as many places at the same time as as you can. Luckily, with production, generally we don't have too many going on at the same time. And I have a now I have a real like, phenomenal team, and a, my partner Ashley is a, a really brilliant producer. So now I'm two, and then we're trying to cultivate other producers. And then inside of our operation, there are other producers, Mike Mayer being one of them, who's you know truly capable storyteller. And, and so that's how we can scale our business is by teaching others how to be producers and giving them credibility so that I don't have to you know, be there all the time. It, was there a point when you were making Spotlight that you sort of knew you had something special for the ages? Honestly, I knew it was important because I cared about the story. I didn't, I didn't see it going as far as it went uh you know i was i think too close to it and and that's always the case for me is that i can never really tell there was really two moments that that gave me some sense of well there was three one my wife told me i was going to win an oscar i thought she was nuts when um, did she say that what before she saw the movie she just had some premonition she woke up one morning and said you're going to win an oscar and i said okay, okay but so so that's where it started but but then I think at the Toronto Film Festival, because our first review in Venice was a disaster. Uh, there was a, a variety review and the guy was just, just ripped it. And I thought, oh, oh boy, here we go. Um, and then, then other reviews started coming in and it became a darling of journalists, uh, which I think is a big reason why it had so much success in the, you know, from, from, from the critics. But uh, at Toronto, my father said, and I was surprised. He, he said, this one is going maybe all the way. And then you told me when, when we had our premiere in, uh, in Boston that you felt like it had a real shot. And so I, for me, it, it's, I'm certainly, I'm, I, I'm certainly um, not humble, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm self-aware and I just didn't see, nor did I actually, I didn't even, I didn't, it was not something that I thought would ever be in the conversation until the momentum started to come. And, um, and you know, there it is. But it was, I think like the night before I was like, I was more nervous last night because I was gonna sit for an hour with my scary professor today and I want to <laughs> sound smart. But, but I think that the, the night before we were not supposed to win. We were sort of the, all the prognosticators put us third, but I sort of had a, I just had a good feeling about it. And, um, and it, you know, you want to win. Like, that's the other thing. 
that that uh, you know I'll, I'll tell the truth now for everybody uh that's been lying everybody really wants to win it's like it's an the whole it's an honor thing like it is but people want to win and because it's you know you don't you don't go into our business without thinking that someday that could happen and so when you get that close like the pressure was was really substantial you know we, we all felt it so okay so you're in the room you're in the tuxedo take us through that well um my wife was like just at the worst part of being pregnant uh so in one side of my mind i'm thinking like okay is she okay the other i've got all kinds of uh you know, emotions. We've been through a, a, a really long journey on the film. There was this one thing that I had done, which I'll share the story. They, I, I was sort of, um, Lauren, my wife said, you should, you know, manifest things. You should meditate on things that you want to happen. And so I would, I would meditate on things for my family and meditate on things that mattered. And then at the end, I would throw in like a meditation on winning an Oscar just to see it, you know? And what happened was Leo, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was was had won for best actor and I knew the final award was best picture and I saw through like you couldn't see it on television but I you could see it in the room that Morgan Freeman was coming out to present the the final award now they don't tell any of the nominees who's presenting which award that's a surprise but I had always pictured Morgan Freeman presenting the award and when he did that it gives me a little goosebumps here I, I think I grabbed my, did I grab your knee? I grabbed my wife's like leg and I said, we won. And she's, she said, what are you talking about? But I just, in that moment, I knew it. And uh, in my heart, you know, I didn't actually know it. And, and there it was, it, it's surreal. Um, it was, it was a totally surreal moment, but it also was a, it was a pivotal moment for me in my career because the next morning I woke up and uh, and I was just like, I had to race back to New York because I was shooting a movie and I had all these other obligations. And I realized that I, I wasn't happy. Like I, I was, I mean, I was excited, but I, I wasn't happy. I was just relieved. And I think one of the things about the entertainment industry is because of the, the way that it rolls, you don't get a lot of time to celebrate moments. And, uh, and so that was a real turning point for me professionally. I made some real changes in, in my life. And that's when I decided I wanted to go out on my own that morning. So um, it was really cathartic in that regard that I, I wanted to make sure I found joy in what I was doing. And, uh, and so it was, a, it was a really, and obviously, you know, for me, I didn't realize, my, I think my wife, now she tells me the story that she was like kind of disappointed that I went only because she realized that we were going to be out all night and she was, <laughs> she was pregnant. But, um, but I think uh, what I realized, I didn't realize then how important it would be for me. Like I, I didn't realize someday I would get the alumni achievement award from Brandeis University. And, uh, but, but the doors that it has opened weirdly is, is it's much bigger outside of the entertainment industry than inside of it. Yeah. You know, CEOs of global companies take my call uh, if, if, you know, which is great. Yeah. And, and the, the, I, I remember that night it was at the Coolidge, wasn't it? Is that, that's where it debuted? In Boston where we met. Yeah. yeah, we right, saw yeah. And which is a great venue and is uh, now reopened, fortunately. And uh, it had to score with a hometown crowd. Or the, and I think that's maybe, you know, I, it, you could feel the momentum in the room because if uh, the, the film didn't score with that crowd, which knew the story so well, it, uh, it might not have gotten the kind of bounce it, it ultimately did. And there were scenes in the film that I think if you're a Bostonian, you remembered so well in that moment when the Boston Globe that Sunday, you know, landed on everybody's doorstep is a moment I think if you're a Boston, especially if you're a Boston Irish Catholic, you might remember that moment and then open up the Boston Globe and reading those revelations and black and white and how stark right. they were. You know, and uh, I thought the, the film was very powerful in that. And it got the accents right, which is- it got the accents right, but, but yeah. look, the, the that, most- That's what, what's most important about a Boston that, movie to us. We, we, we did shoot in Boston for that reason. But the, look, the, the reality is the most important thing for me personally that came out of that film, other than the obvious like career advantages, mm -hmm. that that movie really made impacts. And yeah. you know, I remember we would go to these Q and A's 
uh, you know, you do these panels all the time when you have a movie coming out. And the, I mean, in every instance, at least one person would raise their hand and say, I, I'm a survivor and I've never told anyone. And this movie gave me space to do that. And so, you know, that's when, when life and art, you know, really for me come together is when you can actually touch people. And, you know, whether you make a comedy or a drama, if you can give somebody something meaningful, whether it's a distraction or a, a provocative, um, you know, an opportunity for them to, 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 to go through a, an inner conversation or a shared conversation, that, that's a big win. And, and that movie was, you know, obviously very impactful that way. And we had, you know, dialogue with the Pope after, and it was, you know, I don't know how much it's really changed, but there have been some positive changes. And certainly, you know, that was, that's the best takeaway. And I still get, you know, letters from survivors all the time. Uh, do you choose films with that mind? That's uh, you know what you might call either social justice or social transformation or some of your projects. Um, I think some of my investors are watching, so we're very capitalist in our motives. However, I think they also love that we do have a double bottom line in our approach. Like we want we we are a business and we want to make movies that deliver audiences uh, or TV. But you know we always look at, at projects through the lens of, you know, is there a, a more impactful message? I think ultimately, uh, I personally gravitate towards that. My, you know, The Laundromat uh, was, you know, Jake Bernstein's book, which won the Pulitzer, uh, uh, about Masak Fonseca. It was, you know, really about privacy. And um, I did the Julian Assange movie and, and the report, obviously, and the movie Worth. So I think we gravitate towards those kinds of uh, films but we're also making the Hulk Hogan movie coming up. And, and, and even that has pathos. I think what we're trying to do is find a way to, I don't wanna make documentaries for this. I mean, we, we make them, but I don't only wanna make worthy movies. I wanna make commercial movies that are worthy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think Spotlight was kind of hit the bullseye on that because it played a bit like a thriller and it was more accessible. Um, it was a small target. So, but I do, yeah, we want to, we want to do good. I mean, that's why I'm in this business. Ultimately, uh, I went to this international school before Brandeis. All my, all my colleagues or my, my former classmates are working for philanthropic organizations or in government. And we all kind of wanted to change the world. That was the idealism of it. And I always saw the power of storytelling as a way, my way to make that contribution. Um, and, and, you know, 13 Reasons Why, which was a huge hit was obviously about you know exploring adolescent themes and and conversation was stirred, uh, you know, and, and even things that may feel a bit more commercial on the surface. Uh, Dickinson, um, which I'm so proud of, is, is you know is and your American studies background, sir. And of course, yes. you you know we want to tell stories that are accessible and 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 feel broad enough that because uh, the ultimate goal is to capture people that aren't interested in the subject. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, you know, you don't have a, a true audience. I mean, that's that's the point of art is that it's consumed by more than just the person for whom you make it. And uh, so, I don't want to sound too idealistic, but I am deeply passionate. And and a lot of a lot of our businesses are about important things. And so, you know, Mike Mayer's uh, podcast group. You know, one of the big projects that we're launching in the fall is uh, Person of the Week with Time where we're gonna explore all of the, you know, the most impactful people in the world each week. And our book imprint, you know, we have, we have this, a, a huge book coming out in the fall uh, about the vaccine race. And we have Cody Keenan's book, uh, the Obama speechwriter coming mm -hmm. out. So, so we, we look for, for the, the stuff that's gonna connect with the widest audience, regardless of the medium, but, you know, I want it to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh I guess my other question would be, you're one of the, uh, uh, like a lot of producers, a lot of people in the business now, uh, where before it seemed people were kind of tracked either to television or to movies. Uh, in the last 10 years, those kind of boundaries have been pretty well eliminated. Uh, you, you're working in like, uh, you know, net uh, streaming, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 Roku, the world of Roku. And you're also doing theatrical projects. And is are, are any sort of distinctions in those two categories meaningless now? Uh, they weren't 20 years ago, but they seem to be now. 10 years, maybe less. Yeah. 
I mean, look, obviously theatrical has, has challenges right now. Um, pandemic aside, which has been the biggest challenge, the, the greater challenge is that it takes a lot for people to leave their home and spend a lot of money to go see a movie. Uh, it's not the only distraction that's available anymore. Um, most people have very uh, sophisticated or at least more sophisticated electronic setups at home. And so they can experience a movie in, in, a, in a nice enough way that they don't feel like they're sacrificing it. I think that, I think I read once that the average person in America lives 22 miles from a movie theater and uh, which I was surprised by, but you know, cause I live in a bubble, but, but I think that's probably a, an accurate fact. And, and it's like 80 something dollars on average to take a family of four Good to Lord. see a movie yeah. and, and feed them overpriced popcorn. So to get people into the theater, given all of that and given YouTube and gaming and, and short attention spans and all of that, uh, and then you add that to uh, add, add a pandemic to it, um, it's gonna be tough to rebound. And also the migration of all the talent into streaming because before television was, if, was, a, was a sacrifice if you were a movie star, now it's the opportunity. So um, I think we have our, our work cut out for us on theatrical. The flip side is there are many people that love to see movies in theaters. I, the last two weeks have been very heartening for me seeing what's happened with um, with John's, with uh, A Quiet Place and yeah. and the, the fact that people came out in, in droves to see it. I, I think In the Heights is having a similar weekend now. And and maybe maybe it's sort of given a, 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 all of this isolation we've experienced has given it a boost, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, but the streaming opportunities have been phenomenal too because all the consolidation in the marketplace with Disney and now Discovery, HBO and Netflix being as, success as successful as it is and Apple, it's great for content creators because there's a, you know, there's a, there's a cold war going on and, and I'm, I make the weapons. So I'm, it's great for creative people and that's great for actors and writers and filmmakers and editors and gaffers. And so, so I'm excited by what's happening with the entertainment industry right now. I'm actually, the last year was rough for everybody because there's just a handful of things that got made, but now it's like, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, it's like a complete slingshot. Everybody's running and, and going. So, well, yeah, and and we all hope it sort of winds up that in the theater at some point. Because, uh, sure. like you, I went to Quiet Place. I, I've been going to movies since last summer. I mean, the, the the AMC's were open here. You had to wear a mask, and anytime I would go, I, you know, because I'm a movie person, I go see. Russell Crowe movies. I saw both Liam Neeson movies. Yeah, they were, they were all great. It was just so great to be in a theater. <laughs> but it was not until Quiet Place, where you were there without a mask, and there was a pretty good sized crowd for it. Uh, it was like single digits before that, that you sort of felt that experience that we, we all treasure in a motion picture theater, like in the Coolidge watching Spotlight, when you're with a group of people in the same time, uninterrupted by your damn devices, uh, watching a, a very powerful, well-done film. And uh, that was the first time really in 14 months that I've had that experience. And it really was something to- Yeah, uh, I think, I think what propels the success of any consumer product, movies, television, or, you know, uh, fidget spinners or whatever they're called, is yeah. this, this, this desire for a shared experience, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, has been enhanced by the isolation. So my hope is that this opportunity for a shared experience will come back as quickly as the world is, um, hopefully. So we'll see. I mean, I think there's definitely, you know, Netflix understands the importance of theatrical. They talk to us all the time about it. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think you'll see more. I mean, you'll probably see Netflix theaters mm -hmm. uh, is my guess and they'll, you know, let people come watch movies for free and, and now in the theater, which would be great. But uh, I mean, I don't know that independently, but that's my, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, th I think that, you know, art should be consumed in the medium that it's made for. But I think, you know, people are watching on their phones and we have to be, you know, we have to, at the end of the day, if all you want is a theatrical experience for your film, my, my personal feeling is that, uh, you're making it for you and not for them, right? You're, we should be making it for the people to, to, and I understand, 
you want to exhibit your film in its best possible version. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that doesn't mean that something that is made for television isn't impactful and and meaningful and 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 you know audiences will devour it. Oh yeah, and the, and just the utter con as an educator, just the utter convenience where you know a student if he's interested in Alfred Hitchcock can watch six Alfred Hitchcock movies over the weekend. Uh, and, and so it, it really does have that very you know, powerful educational aspect to it. What I miss though, and I think your generation had this in the 90s, is that experience of, you'd all go to the movie theater together. I think we had screenings in Wasserman at the, at the time and you'd, you'd all sort of trek there together, see it together, then trek back. And you're talking about the movie for that entire experience it's sometimes very difficult getting students to say, to sit down even at their computer for 90 minutes of uninterrupted viewing where they don't have their cell phone or, or whatever. So on the one hand, it's really a terrific uh, educational enhancement that they have. Uh, and then you can just put up the movies on our, our latte page at Brandeis or streaming. Uh, but if there's one thing I miss is that sort of that shared communal experience of when they come in the next Wednesday, you know, everybody's loaded for bear to talk about the film. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but you miss that, but I'm not sure they miss that. I just think that's because they've never had it. Right. But I, well, no, actually not. I, I, I think it's because they have it, but, but it's just in a different form. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's driving mm -hmm. the, the binge watch of Netflix or Amazon the conversation is still happening. It's just not mm -hmm. happening on the walk to and from the, the theater. It's happening on Twitter and Instagram and mm -hmm. it's happening in real time over text. So I'm not sure, it's certainly a very different way to experience the conversation, but, but I think the conversation still happens and I think it's what's driving successful content. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean to be contrarian with my- No, no, you, that, that's one of the things that was always great. I don't want you to fail you with your now. colleagues in the class. You're yeah, it always, always here, come but, back. And even but, if you were wrong, we'd listen to you. <laughs> but I, look, I don't, what do I know? But I just feel like- Yeah, what do you know? You're just but like, I think the conversation mm -hmm. is still very present. Mm -hmm. And I think that to, to and that's my, that's my beef with purist only mm -hmm. has to be movie theater no, I make movies I want people to see in the theater. I work with filmmakers and I completely embrace their desire for those film those movies to be seen that way. But I don't, but I think that it is a disconnect from reality to think that a 20 year old student is not having that conversation. It's just, it's on TikTok and they're quoting it or it's on Twitter and they're mm -hmm. tweeting about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I look at movies. When I have movies or shows coming out, I look at, I don't look at Rotten Tomatoes mostly because it hurts my feelings, but also because I don't think it's a real, it, it's a real um, measure. The measure is I look at how, what people are saying on Twitter and how people are experiencing it after the fact. And that's the immediate, the immediate response and it's the shared response is, is actually more present than it was without social media and without that, that opportunity. So I mean, if, you, if you go on Twitter right now and type in a quiet place, you're going to see thousands of people talking about, I just went, it was amazing. How was the theater? Mm -hmm. So it is a, still a shared experience. It's just a, it's just a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we got some questions coming in for you sure. here. Uh, let's see. Uh, from Michael, what projects are you working in now? Which ones are you most excited about? Um, well, we have Worth coming out on Netflix in the fall. This is the Ken Feinberg story, who um, is the special master of the 9-11 Commission, uh, a really amazing human, and Michael Keaton plays him. So that'll come out. It's not, uh, have, we haven't announced the date, but it'll be September, October. And uh, we're, we're really excited that um, the Obamas came on to that uh, mm -hmm. to, to work with us. And so they'll be involved in promoting that and, uh, and having conversations about that movie. We're shooting uh, the third season of our Apple show Dickinson right now. We're excited about a, a series of, um, of, of documentaries we're doing with Time Magazine about the most impactful events of 2020 that we're doing with you know, world-class folks like Trevor Noah and LeBron James and Jose Andres and Angelina Jolie and others. Uh, so we're excited about that. That'll be around at the end of the year. Um, I mean, we have a bunch of stuff. 
that'll probably happen. Our podcasts, we're very excited about Time Person of the Week. Um, we have uh, a number of scripted podcasts that are dropping soon. Um, we're excited about our books that are coming out, uh, which is our first one is The First Shots by Brendan Burrell, which is a deep exploration of an embedded journalist inside of Operation Warp Speed. Uh, we have, uh, so, so there's a lot of things coming out um, and, you know, probably we're at the mercy of so many people about when something will happen. But uh, I also think Hulk, the Hulk Hogan movie that we're doing, which is sort of an exploration of fallen hero, um, the ascent and, and fall and reascent of a hero um, through the lens of Hulk Hogan, which is really exciting. Chris Hemsworth is going to play him. So that's teetering on a green light. So we'll see. Uh, you've answered this a little bit, but there's a question about how the pandemic affected the business and uh, where do you think the business is going post pandemic? I think, I think the, well, obviously the pandemic affected the business immensely because production came to a, a halt and then it only slowly came back and it's still only about to peak again. But um, I, I think the, the bad news was everything stopped. I think the good news is because there was now a flood of the queue was much longer and deeper. I think the material that will find its way to the top is going to be better because there's been a, a buildup of opportunity for the, for the financiers to pick from. So I expect that the, the, the new crop of movies and TV uh, are going to be um, better by virtue of that pandemic. And, um, and I think really the best thing, maybe this is too idealistic, but I think a lot of people say they, they became human again, right? The entertainment industry, uh, like so many other industries, devours people's humanity with the time it sucks from them and, and the obligations. And I think I've heard a lot of people say that just re remembering things that mattered, uh, family and spending more time at home and, and creating a truer work-life balance. I think that's a positive impact not just in the entertainment industry, but across the world. I hope, um, I hope so. For me, it certainly was. Um, and so, and I think that informs the quality of storytelling. It informs the quality of products that are released in other industries, because, you know, if it's not infused with some sense of humanity, it probably won't connect with humanity. So. Can I ask you, uh, uh, since you, got a background of course you're in a global industry you've got a background in international relations to say a little something about china and the censorship that china exerts on the motion picture industry there's a lot of conversation about that just today i read that the uh, uh the chinese government is now censoring hong kong cinema for uh, purposes of national security right uh and where do you think that's going because the uh, China does exert a kind of censorship control over a lot of Hollywood content. For sure. I mean, they don't, they don't exert control over the creative. They just didn't, well, they exert control over the distribution of it, right? So that's the problem for so many of our stories is that if they don't check certain boxes for, for, the, for the Chinese government, we just don't see, we just don't see an audience. So much so that when we make a deal with a studio now, and they calculate worldwide box office, China is separate. It's yeah. like, it's, it's the wild card. Because you have movies, you could have a movie, a tentpole movie here that can do $200 million domestically that does nothing in China for the same reasons you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then you can have like, there, are, there was a movie, I think two years ago, I can't remember what it was called, um, but it was a movie that was, like an abysmal failure here in, in the States and it made like $70 million in China because, because they, they pick the product and there's just not so much. So it's an interesting thing to see. Um, and, and I don't know, I mean, look, we're in a weird political climate. I think, um, I think it would be a very meaningful audience for us to, uh, to, to be able to deliver product to like any industry. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's unclear where it's going. I mean, I do see a lot of Chinese money coming into Hollywood. And I think the good news is that's good for Hollywood, but also I think that will create more influence inside of, of China because like Jack Ma and Alibaba was really one of the sort of only um, arbiters there for a long, long time. He's, he's been a bit disintermediated now. 
um, we'll see. But if there's more Chinese influence here to bring it back there, maybe we can we can plow through it a bit. Uh, there's a question here, a practical one about what are your tips for pitching product projects? Hmm. Know your audience, know your product, be succinct, study the market. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to pitch something that's already been pitched. You don't want to pitch something that couldn't work in the market. You want to make sure you're pitching to the right person. You want to be sure that uh, that person has the ability to give you good advice because most, you know, there's a lot of bad advice. So know, know your audience. Uh, what filmmakers do you find most exciting today? Who do you like to work with in the business? I mean, wow, there's so many. I, I really love Taika Waititi. I want to work with him. I haven't yet. Uh, I think, um, I mean, I work with so many great filmmakers. I, I've been working with Kerry Fukunaga since he was at NYU in 2005. And he, you know, to see him go from Sin Nombre, a beautiful, uh, intimate, Spanish language movie to directing James Bond, which will come out this fall. I've, I've really enjoyed watching his evolution. We worked together on True Detective uh, and we also did a, a show Maniac together. So I think he's world-class. I've been, you know, I love Soderbergh. I've been working with Steven for a long, long time. And for me, what I'm attracted to with storytellers is, uh, is folks that are willing to take risks and whose body of work is differentiated. Uh, project to project. Um, the, the greats, if you took the top 10, um, you know, other than a few like maybe Quentin and Tarantino and Wes, you don't necessarily automatically know it's the same person. I mean, the same, you know, Peter Jackson's movies look different, his early movies and his later movies. Chris Nolan's movies have a similar quality, but they're different, they're different canvases. Spielberg, Soderbergh, these guys, these guys are Patty Jenkins from Monster to Wonder Woman. There's, there's, uh, I'm interested in, in artists that uh, that tell the right story for for the palette that they're you know for the canvas they're working on and um, and not being like just doing the same thing over and over again. Fair enough. Uh, uh, wanted to make sure you saw the previous one. Oh, how did Brandeis specifically influence your filmmaking? Ah, good question. Um, well. You know, Tom Doherty was was obviously you were a huge impact in my um, the affirmation of my instinct that this was where I wanted to go, and and the and like you said, those moments of 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 discovery with a we were a really unique group of people inside of a university. We kind of traveled in a pack, class to class. Um, I remember uh, when you guys came to the final exam. See, I don't even remember that. But you don't uh, remember that. Is that the one that I was really drunk for or a different one? Uh, that, kidding, kidding. Uh, no, you guys all came uh, in tuxes and evening wear. So the, the, the women <laughs> came in evening wear, the guys came in tuxes, and uh, you opened up champagne before the final exam. That, that, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, but of course, I stopped the drinking in finals. Um, right. yeah, <laughs> well, I would say, good, good. Um, you know, obviously... A good university experience is uh, impacts anyone's career because it it creates perspective and it creates relationships and it creates learning and a, and a thirst for learning, and I think it creates um, conviction. Right? I think Tom, you said earlier that teaching film is different than teaching accounting. The reason is people that are studying film already love it usually, and. Uh, and then people that are studying biology or chemistry or other things, they will fall in love with it or they won't. And if they fall in love with it, it creates that conviction. So for me, that was the great takeaway, um, but also uh, incredible network of Brandeis alumni in, in Hollywood. Uh, that was very helpful to me. And, and we all try to return the favor now. Mm -hmm. I hear from Brandeis students all the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess what else? got me into law school, so that helped too. I think what a lot of people say is that, uh, at least people in the business like yourself and Mike Mayer and other folks, that uh, the sort of the good broad liberal arts education prepares you for a lot of different things. That if you know how to think, you know how to tell a story, that uh, you've got a good background in cultural history, that it 
tends to be able to help you recognize a good project, to connect with an audience, and just to, to be able to read a text for meaning right. and, and to hopefully communicate it to, a, a, to an audience. Uh, earlier, somebody asked how I felt when you got the Oscar. Uh, and uh, since I've been at Brandeis, I've learned this uh, Yiddish word, anakis, which is uh, for the uh, non-conversant is the, uh, the feeling typically a parent feels to his child of, of pride. Uh, so I felt that, of course. Uh, but the other thing uh, I felt was I was not surprised. I mean, that there were, you know, that entire class I knew were accomplished people who would go on to do things that made them happy and that would contribute to the world. So the, uh, the emotion that one didn't feel uh, was, uh, was surprise. Uh, I have a couple other questions here as we start getting ready to close up. Uh, I just uh, see, uh, does, uh, here's a practical question again. Does your company consider pitches from people without agents that could fit the profile of movies you produce, creative nonfiction regarding, for example, uh, World War II? Well, um, that's, a, that's a lot of question. I, we, don't, we don't accept so we don't for legal reasons because there's just so much uh, incoming, but we, but I do from Brandeis family. So, uh, you know, it, it, that is a connected, a connective tissue that if you're in this room, I, I think you can, you can use with us, but generally speaking, you know, we just want to be, uh, first of all, we just have so much incoming that has already been curated by agents and managers and lawyers. Uh, so, so that helps us with quality control of the incoming flow. We get a lot. Um, but also you, I would, I would argue that having a representative is good for you on the approach side, because we would never, we, we, we are honest brokers and deal well. And I think most people are actually, but it's just good for you to have uh, another person or people in the mix that can look at your work and give you a reality check because you really don't get two chances with people. It's very, you know, asking someone to take an hour and a half of their time to read a script from a stranger that's just, you know, like what if somebody knocked on your door and said, hey, um, I know you're busy, but let's go sit for an hour and a half and have a conversation. I mean, it has, it's a commitment. So you want to make sure that when you approach people, it's, it's, it's your best, you're putting your best foot forward. And um, so, so the advice part of it is do that. The practical answer, can, can, we, can we talk? It, you know, you can find me. <laughs> That's good to know. Uh... I think we asked the, oh, it says for Michael, I used to love BTV back in the day. I know your team got together for a reunion some years ago. Any chance of another reunion show? It's funny you say that. I, I, I would love to do it. it. You know, the, the, I think it was David Heller started posting all of these old videos, which are, it's really kind of embarrassing, uh, some of them, but uh, no, we love, we love that. That was a great experience. I don't know. But yeah, maybe we do. Maybe right now we, I mean, if the, the question is, can we get the same money as the friends reunion got? And if we can get that, <laughs> then I probably think that, that, you know, Marta Raven and the gang will get us, we'll get that together. Um, but look, it was a really fun, it was a really fun experience to do that for, for us. I don't know what's happening if that still exists at the school. I hope it does, but, uh, but um, yeah, it was, it was one of my favorite things that I did there. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you a little bit more about what's going on today in the motion picture industry. Of course, you know, one of the revolutions that's happened concurrent with uh, the pandemic is the whole Me Too movement. Has that in any way affected your, the sense of the projects, the protocols of uh, filmmaking? It hasn't affected our protocols because I feel, you know, I, I feel that we've always been sort of really aware of the these issues and 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 we haven't had them arise in our own orbit directly it affects the the transactional nature of the business and in, insofar as you know we we're always more cognizant about making sure we have diversity in our projects we're more cognizant about having uh, as much gender you know equal gender representation as possible if it's a story about women um you know, we should have a woman director or, or try to find one. I mean, this is, this is not even necessarily uh, a response. It's more like that, that makes sense. You should use people uh, that, that, are, that are best equipped to tell the story. At the same time, you know, I think that it's really important for people to remember that artists, I mean, I'm a Jew who made Spotlight. 
-hmm. today people would say, I think, well, why is this, is this right? Like um, people should be able to tell meaningful stories uh, with elegance, even if they're, I mean, that's sort of the, to me, the biggest challenge of art is, you know, going beyond your comfort zone and learning something. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, 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 I fear that the pendulum swing too far could make, create, could be the um, enemy of creativity. But mm -hmm. I think where it has come largely has been very important in terms of protecting, you know, protecting all the rights and dignities of people that have been poorly treated. And, and that is something that we've seen a lot of, so. Yeah, I, I think of that uh, like when I, I was watching the other night, uh, uh, you know, the, the Ben Kingsley uh, uh, Gandhi, you know, which is like this amazing performance of this British actor as Gandhi, as somebody who's not. And sort of the thrill sometimes of watching those things is seeing one identity transform into another. But I don't know if you could make Gandhi today without casting an Indian actor, you know, that and yeah. that, that sort of thrill of transformation uh, and, uh, you know, like or you know, William Hurt and Kiss of the Spider Woman, you know, playing the uh, the gay uh, individual. Like, I, I wonder if that's a moment that's just gone in film history, that sense of seeing somebody transform into somebody else that they're not. It's definitely a thing right now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's gone forever. Uh, look, I also understand the other argument, though, which is mm -hmm. that, you know, there's also millions of, or probably thousands of brilliant Indian actors that could play Gandhi. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I get it. I get it both. I get both sides of the equation and, and we're obviously conscious of that. Um, but, you know, we, we are in a time where that is constantly, you know, part of the conversation. I think we got room for maybe one more question here. Uh, somebody is curious about how you decide which project goes to which streaming platform. Well, um, my company has a deal at Netflix, so that's where we go first uh, on the movie side and on the television side where we have an even more robust relationship with them. Um, but I mean, obviously the Disney has its own very clear brand. I think Hulu and, and Amazon, HBO Max and Netflix have a lot of overlap in some, in some ways. I mean, we go where, we usually go to all of them and we, sell it to whoever wants to make it or whoever wants to make it in the best possible way. So, um, but I personally spend a lot of time at Netflix because they've been, you know, I've been involved with them since house of cards and from the jump and, um, and they've been, you know, they've been hugely supportive of, of me and my partners and my company. So. Uh, Mike, I see Ron has popped up here on the, hey. uh, on the zoom uh, Brady. And, you, and I just want to, uh, Thank you for this. It's been a pleasure. I hope we can do it. Right, thank you. you know, you've been, as usual, very eloquent and informative. I have jumped in here and I do want to thank both of you. That was a, a terrific conversation and one that, of course, is not only interesting. Oh, we now have a fire alarm going off here. I have to apologize. So I'm going to have to sign off a little bit faster, but I just want to thank uh, both of you guys and also congratulate you, Michael. And thank I'm going to head you. out. Okay. So long, everyone. Thank you for Thanks, joining everybody. us. We'll see you Thanks, at the next Tom. alumni event. Bye-bye. Bye, old friends. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Ron. Great timing. Yeah, <laughs> great timing. <laughs> Hey, Mike, uh, thanks. We'll, uh, My we'll pleasure. Touch. No, it's really great connecting with you again. And uh, I'll see you in LA, I hope, once I the hope. world opens I'm up. Soon. Or you, you in Boston. Okay, next time you do a Boston-accented film, you're going to have to come here. Oh, we'll be there, for sure. Tom Brady movie. Yeah. Oh, now that might not do well here, but like <laughs> kill in Florida. Take care. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye.